comes to pizza down just because of that reason there's so many trolls in that server it's ridiculous oh man that sucks uh it's a big you know free pizza uh you're gonna get a lot of trolls is <laughs> <laughs> the cheesy world of trolls like yeah <laughs> i can't i don't know how snacks does it he swims in it all day long yeah. it must be rough yeah true, true he's got such a positive attitude it's amazing like yeah. Aragorn, he does son of Arthur. he is a head yeah, so i was driving motivated forward. with that i was thinking about going out to the the san francisco uh pizza dow thing but uh last year's was pretty sketch and so i'm just like <laughs> pretty cool I did, a party. I did a party the last year for 100 people for my community Everybody got their pizza. I didn't get paid and I was accused of not doing the pizza party. And I have pictures of the fucking pizza party and I share the pictures. But the Latin American community, did you know that recently I connected with, I think it was Chair, and he told me that that is like an, a, scam, a, a scam model where they blame you to steal and then they steal. Right. Yeah. Well, crud. Um, let's just keep it with snacks then. And so, you know, uh, I guess at this point, uh, just to keep it <laughs> uh, on the level of we just, want pizza. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at the very least, you know, uh, maybe a, uh, you know, a moment for us to all have a, a slice of pizza ourselves or something like that. Order in. <laughs> and uh just uh you know as a community call uh yeah maybe maybe that can happen uh not necessarily uh you're relying on pizza dow or anybody else my recommendation and and i'm done speaking <laughs> <laughs> So otherwise, I'm uh, the other speaking, of course, back to, uh, you know, Jose, let's talk some more about, uh, you know, bridge building and, uh, you know, actually the, the whole idea of, uh, you know, this other organization was whether or not uh, somebody's, uh, you know, being the bridge builder with uh, that other organization that we're no longer... <laughs> Uh, so, bottom line, uh, it will be good to uh, get a yeah, maybe a, a, a short list of uh, partners guilds that need you know refreshing that are you know. Sure, man. Uh, we, we can to respond. I can, I can share you with you those links later, like yep. after the community gathering and. Uh, I think we should also arrange a call with Path to clear out uh, like the more detailed stuff, like which questions to do, uh, because we also need to make like a revamp of uh, to streamline that process better. Cool. All right, let's do that. Anybody else in this pre show? We did some beautiful music yesterday. Vanessa, well, actually, Vanessa did beautiful music yesterday with Pedro, a friend. Oh, Felens, did you hear Pedro the other day, the pianist? So we we, we went there. Uh, Pedro is working on a, on a song, and uh, he asked Vanessa if she wanted to, to perform. And we went there yesterday recording the song and it was just amazing it was oh. a cover song from aurora yeah i was there for the whole show last week so yeah that was fantastic you guys you know, improvised uh the whole schmear i mean it was it was a great moment in uh in easy's corner absolutely 
Yeah, can't wait to, to hear the what you recorded. Uh, is it with video uh, of your guys' performance or just purely recording? Looks like you have a mic issue, Jose. <laughs> A gorilla, a gorilla guy. Sorry, can you repeat? Well, that. all I was asking, uh, the recording that you did yesterday, is was that uh, uh, you know, with video or just oh, they, music? They are working on a music production. They were like, you know, separated by channels. Uh, they still need to post-produce it. But uh, so far it's an audio, but we want to do, you know, I sort of a little addition with some recordings I got from yesterday on the final product because it's actually super beautiful. Vanessa sings so great and you know, we were at a studio, you know, everything professional and it was uh, magical. This is a new stage for, for us and we are just enjoying it so much. Sweet. All right. Looking forward to hearing it. Happy to see Lerner, Waka, traveling through time. Woo! Actually, I'm really, I'm really, it's, it's really nice. I don't know. I don't know if it was Musashi fault, <laughs> but like both projects today has a similar name, you know, what a, what a nice synchronicity. Yeah, and today we get to all, all of us who have not been exposed to arcology get a, a nice uh, exposure to it today through a few different perspectives and uh, a couple different communities that are also interlinked. Looking so forward, I have questions already. I want to know, first of all, like, what, what, what does mean arcology? <laughs> We will get into that very shortly. Yes. <laughs> so Waka, we are we're going on a journey today into uh, past realms as well as um, mostly future realms where we have taken a lot from our past realms, learned from them, and are rebuilding a whole new one. These guys here today, our, our guests today, um, like metagamers, are the revolutionaries in our world. They are willing to be the change and they are willing to step out into realms that we've never stepped into um, or out of. And it, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be revolutionary uh, that these communities are each doing their thing. I don't want to get too too deep into it, but yeah, time is a very strong illusion. Almost as strong as money. Yeah. Well, you know, uh what is rep what is money representative of if it's not your time space? <laughs> time. Yeah. True true currency right there, fellas. I mean it is a quarter after. We could get started if we want to. Lerner, do you want to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, and then kind of get into what you've been doing with the Arcology Builders and Detroit Arcology? Some of our some of our guests that that are here and some that are going to be watching on on social channels uh, may not recognize Lerner right away, but some old schoolers in metagame may recognize him because he used to be called crypto goth um slow down and i i just came to that realization yesterday and realized oh wow this is the same guy that i i you know fell in love with what he was doing a while back <laughs> so happy to have you learner uh feel free to take the stage uh thanks musashi and thanks everyone i've turned on push to talk because there was a weird discord issue and a previous event where there was an echo and uh, maybe I'll turn it off if it gets too annoying, but yeah, let me know if I cut out or you can't hear me, but we'll do. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me to speak. I'm also looking forward to hearing traveling through time and uh, Musashi did put us together. So I think he's got arcology on the brain and he's just, you know, looking out for it everywhere and the universe is giving it to him. And then, and he brought us together. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing 
that perspective as well. Um, should I share my screen? Is that, can I do that now? Yeah, we love that. And I see your screen. One of my favorite projects. Thank you. Well, um, so <laughs> this is probably like against etiquette to reveal, but, but my name in real life is Paul Pham. And uh, I used to be called CryptoGoth. That's my GitHub username. And then uh, these days I go by lifelong learner. And uh, I've been a good friend of Dispulik and Musashi for many years, even though I guess we didn't know it and <laughs> or had different names. And so I, Dispulik has renamed me learner and this server. Um, and I, I guess like I'm mostly focused on learning. I used to be a teacher. Um, I, I love coding. I, I love pair programming with people. So if those are interests that call to anyone, uh, please let me know. We can pair program on metagame code or your own personal projects. Um, or, you know, something creative. So that would make, uh, that would be happiness making. So today I'd like to talk about uh, Detroit Arcology, which is a project for uh, regenerative architecture that I'm working on in Detroit, in the, the Motor City. And uh, this is a set of older slides from a previous presentation. So I apologize if things are out of date, but it's also super interesting for me to go through and see how things have changed, you know, as the project evolves. Um, so this is a house in Detroit that my friend Adrian uh, renovated. And so I would come visit him, you know, around 2018, 19. Uh, and I always see this exciting rebuilding of the city of Detroit. There are a lot of abandoned buildings. And, um, you know, he put in a solar panel and, and he got me excited about the possibilities in Detroit. I was living in New York City at the time and I, it was uh, more expensive and challenging to experiment with architecture and and home building, but I've always been fascinated by homes, like how to create a sense of safety. It's um, like one of the big needs that humans have. And uh, without it, you know, lots of other things become difficult. And so all of these themes came together. And in 2020, I moved to Detroit. I lived with my buddy Adrian for a while. And then um, I uh, moved into uh, another house and started working on it. Um, and, um, and I'll say more about that as we go along. So um, my perspective on arcology and traveling through time, I'd love to hear him describe it as well, but it is a combination of the words architecture and ecology. And it was a concept um, pioneered in the seventies or, you know, invented by this experimental architect, Paolo Soleri, who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright and a rival and, you know, a, 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 an, es an escapee from Italian fascism. Uh, at the time. And so he created this experimental city to demonstrate his concepts in the Arizona desert called Arco Santi. It's uh, appeared in SimCity, which is how I think I first came across it as sort of like in the future, humans will live in this utopian, um, you know, the whole city is in one building. It's a, a futuristic hyper building. It's made from modern materials. It's usually sustainably powered from wind and solar. It's got food gardens, you know, everything you need and humans have a limited footprint so that they can enjoy and coexist with nature, but also still have all the benefits of technology. So I guess we would call it a uh, green pill or regen or, um, um, yeah, th those movements are still alive today, thankfully. And it's, um, uh, I think it was heavily influenced by arcology and so more green pill images. Um, and then I'm interested in questions of sort of like, you know, in this utopia, um, you know, well, who, who gets to live there? Who designs it? How do we, uh, how do we pay for it? Um, how do we get there from here? So it seems like a big jump, right? Like the this futuristic green pill image and then um, houses in Detroit, right? A plentiful housing stock where we don't want to bulldoze it, even though lots of it is being bulldozed. Um, but but we could reuse it. So in, in some sense, it's like one kind of green rebuilding. And um, it still sort of takes focused uh, time and effort and it um, but it's in a city where people are used to assembly line efforts and, uh, you know, a lot of manual construction skill. And so um, that's, um, that's why um, I started, I wanted to start here. And then I have been a member of the Web3 and cryptocurrency movements for a while. And uh, I've been interested in like, well, you know, we, we all know of, uh, um, <laughs> it has a reputation for being very ephemeral, uh, for being very, uh, volatile. And um, also, you know, sometimes, you know, we have things like yield farming and staking and, and airdrops and rewards and things that 
in some sense, make it easy to have, um, you know, to have a lifestyle where you maybe don't worry so much about material concerns or not, or you're able to supplement your material concerns by like dreaming and working on something bigger. And uh, so could we apply that in some way to building something tangible in the real world? There's a, you know, people in a uh, maker DAO um, who mint the stable coin die. We're talking about real world assets, uh, RWAs for a while as like collateral for minting you know, you have the most ephemeral, ephemeral of uh, <laughs> currencies or tokens, and then you back it by the most tangible things you can think of, which are houses and buildings. And uh, and there are people doing that. There's a loan pro, pro, their loan program called New Silver. I think they're the main ones doing it. They're backing a pool called Centrifuge. And so the some die that you can transact with today is backed by houses that people are renovating. So that's one avenue we considered. Um, so, um, yeah, housing, I am interested in housing for like solving human problems. I, um, there's a, a lot of research. I won't go through all of the, the slides. Uh, in some places like Finland, they like give people houses first and, uh, and then they like um, use that as a lead in to like reduce um, many other problems. And uh, I also became interested in uh, community land trusts, which are a way of separating land and home ownership. Um, and this is not new, but it's still like rare. Uh, the first one was started in Georgia in the seventies, but it lets um, nonprofits steward the land and then people um, own land on top. And um, there hasn't been sort of a full fledged one in Detroit yet. There are many people who like want to form one, but it's, there's a lot of uh, entrenched forces against it. So I don't know if it's the, um, it's not a main approach, but if we had an ideal future, we could design a land trust would be one of it. And it could be governed by uh, a DAO. I, I tried in 2019, I gave a presentation. Um, and at the time I was using a, I was a member of a DAO movement called uh, DAO stack, which some of you may know. And I was like super excited about it. And uh, I, I gave this impassioned speech and presentation and, you know, it, it kind of fell flat in Detroit. A lot of people sort of like gave me blank stares afterwards and, um, and so I, I continued to work on it and thought like, well, you know, we just need a proof of concept. And, uh, but there's a technical hurdle. A lot of people um, in Detroit who are interested in housing, you know, they, you know, I set them up with a MetaMask wallet and they would forget their seed phrase. And then, um, you know, time would go by and it would never seem like the, the way they wanted to spend their uh, Saturday afternoons uh, or something. So then I saw like, well, the, there, there's probably some other way of integrating housing and web three. And, um, and, uh, as time goes on, I'm, I'm really still open to finding this way to integrate them, but continuing to work on the housing part in the meantime. And, uh, there are many parties involved in home renovation. Um, you know, there's the, the people who want to buy the home first time home buyers, usually families, there's the builder, there's the home, which is, you know, there are many vacant homes in Detroit. And then there's a mortgage there are lenders that want to lend to people who are uh, renovating, usually for low-income families. And the, um, I guess the potential I saw for Web3 was organizing uh, people or creating a, uh, an engine for renovating engines so that the first home that is um, renovated and sold would help uh, generate rental income or in some ways pay for the future houses and sort of continue as a, in a nonprofit cycle to sort of, um, people could contribute. There's a framework for people to plug into. They understand how it works. And um, so the the role, the central role occupied here, you see Detroit Arcology uh, would be organizing um, the finances. So that's still open. We'd love feedback. We'd love more uh, participation if people are interested. And uh, other technologies we've, we uh, know about or projects we know about that we'd love to collaborate with or use. Um, for example, our city DAO, they are managing a, uh, parcel of land in Wyoming. They're using Snapshot. I, I don't know what DAO software they're using, but it's, uh, um, but yeah, we, I've been meaning to um, get more in touch with them and, and participate and see if they're looking to expand. There's another project called Cabin City, which um, Mochi game, the coordination game was, was incubated at uh, Cabin City. It's uh, like a retreat in Texas somewhere and they're looking for new neighborhoods. So that's a possibility we could be a neighborhood. 
the the house I'm working on now is uh, this one, this yellow brick house. It's a single family home. It's like very typical of Detroit. It was built in 1915. Um, it's about 1400 square feet. And the, and the, the approach we're taking is to uh, be a passive house, which is from, uh, an approach from Europe to sort of seal the house envelope and uh, make it super efficient. So reduce the input of fossil fuels needed to heat and cool the home. And to do that by sort of having like, uh, yeah, super airtight, um, super insulated building, um, have solar panels, have energy efficient windows and doors. And so I'm working with an architect and a general contractor. Now that the house has been, you know, um, the project's been going on for about two years now. And so we hope to finish the first house in the first year and then to offer rooms in it for people who, um, our experienced home builders who want to come to Detroit and also transform their own house. So the, in our project, the meaning of regenerative is that we have a house and the house is uh, housing home builders who will work on other houses. So there, there are plenty of other homes on the street or in the surrounding neighborhood um, who could use some love. And uh, we hope to welcome people who sort of uh, have the skills and the desire to uh, keep the engine going. The uh, another approach that we, let me see how much uh, time I have. So the, another approach we want to take is with photogrammetry. So this, um, if any of you use Apple or Mac products, the new M1, M2 custom silicon from Apple has a hardware neural engine and it lets you, has a, and there's a, a part of their library that lets you um, take a bunch of scanned photos, you know, from your smartphone, from your iPhone, and it turns into a 3D image. So these are, this is an image of uh, the home in winter in December. So you can tell it's like pretty snowy. Um, and um, that's sort of the outside and the alleyway. Here's sort of an upstairs hallway. Um, so you can kind of like zoom and walk through it. And, uh, you know, there might be tie-ins with uh, 3D metaverse type projects, you know, maybe Decentraland or ways that people can see, you know, if they contribute to a DAO, they can kind of see this 3D model change over time. Um, you know, it could be like a real-time feed. This this is um, a lot, of, several other projects are now doing this, mostly with LiDAR, where they construct 3D meshes that are updated over time. And um, that was also something I thought about is gamifying, sort of like letting people see their contributions sort of like affect this building. And, you know, I used to play a ton of Warcraft, Starcraft, uh, real-time strategy games where like these anime characters would build something. And I thought like, well, how cool would it be if the things getting built are actually real buildings? And after they're done, you can go visit them. Um, and, or, you know, to know that you make a difference. So that would be, uh, that's one psychological way I was hoping to engage people. Uh, this is the kitchen. This kitchen is, is um, done now. So it's probably the room that's Kitchen and bathroom are done. Let me see if I have a bathroom. Yeah, the meshes are not perfect. Um, you know, sometimes it's a little wobbly. It looks kind of like, you know, like images from mid journey sometimes are stable diffusion turn out wobbly. So uh, maybe this is, uh, it looks like from the, the what is the, under, the underside or the upside down from Stranger Things. So sometimes it looks a little like <laughs> creepy and dreary, but the, but you get the idea that, that it's a bathroom. It's much nicer in real life. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, so that's the current state of the house. Uh, and I, we have community calls on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. Um, so if anyone is interested in joining us, we, we upload the recordings to YouTube um, I'll show, we have a, a website that we'd love visits or feedback. If you're feeling more curious about details there, you can read more about it here, DetroitArcology.org. Um, there's a meetup, there's a video playlist. There is, um, there's also a, uh, a plan before this current house, we are working on uh, A-frames, uh, making sort of a tiny home village. And so we pitched it to the city of Detroit. They're very open to weird concepts like this. So that's another reason why we 
chose to be here instead of New York City because you can build, um, you know, a lot of empty lots of people are open to sort of strange things. And I um, was an apprentice at Open Source Ecology, which is a project in Missouri started by um, Martin Jacobowski, who has a famous TED talk about this global civilization starter kit. You know, what will we need to rebuild civilization from scratch? And I was drawn in by his project of an open source home. And so this is a micro home design from there. He built uh, it with compressed earth brick. And uh, there's one in uh, Belize. I think that's the most famous example, but there've been a number of builds over time in addition to you know, his home, the home he lives in in, in the farm in Missouri. Um, so the city of Detroit was like very open to this. They, they were positive. They encouraged us to continue. And uh, the reason why we, we did it, I guess, was because the, we found an existing single family home that we wanted to renovate Instead, the compressed earth brick, you know, would require a brick press. And there were like a number of things that ended up being harder, but I still like the idea of breaking up a piece of land into smaller, um, letting people live together and share resources, you know, maybe having a, a food garden um, instead of, you know, requiring everyone to buy their own, their own parcel. Although that's, um, that's a possibility as well. So the, the pen that we put, plan that we pitched had this kit called a, uh, an A-frame kit home. So they, it's from a company called Avrame. Uh, they have an office in Salt Lake City, Utah, and they ship you the parts, all everything you need for the exterior of the home on a flatbed of a truck. And, uh, you know, they claim that two people could erect it in, I think it was two weeks. Um, they may have said something shorter, but I think realistic is two weeks. And in reality, a lot of setup work would need to go in beforehand, such as uh, digging in the foundation um, setting up the concrete footers. And so we, we haven't pursued um, this construction yet. Um, in Detroit, you can buy empty lots of land within 500 feet of your house for $250. Um, so that's the cheapest land <laughs> that I know of in the United States. It's in an urban city that has like this close to city services like, like water and electricity, although you can be off grid as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll pause here and... Um, so if any of this resonates with you, please feel free to reach out. We'd love more contributors and uh, thank you for your, um, thanks for your attention. And I'd love to hear ways this could like plug into traveling through times, um, arcology project with a K. For sure. <laughs> and thanks for presenting that. Um, do we have any questions from any of our, our people here? I know Felons, Felons is asking a bit about microgrids. Curious if you have considered creating a neighborhood microgrid consortium. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that particular project, but is it a uh, sort of like mini solar panel installation where people are sort of generating power and exchanging it with each other or using yeah. it to back tokens? Yeah, kind of like uh, what Energy Web uh, has done microgrids, uh, sharing energy and resources. Yeah, he said correct what you said. Yeah, that sounds like a, a great effort. Um, I think I've known for a, a few things like that in a while. One in New York City, I think it was called like L3 um, that a friend pointed me to. And we uh, we don't have solar panels yet. So I think once, once we do, uh, we'd love to participate in any networks like that. It's in general, I think it's it's difficult. It requires a big upfront investment, and so uh, I think to have a neighborhood grid, I guess, would involve other neighbors also generating powers in that way. And you know, solar power is actually still people are pretty skeptical, still skeptical about it in Michigan. You know, like they don't know if there's enough sunlight. There is in the summertime, just not year round. And so, uh, as a as a proof of concept, um, you know, we'd still love to gather data and also convince ourselves that it's feasible, but in, in principle, yeah, we love the idea of sharing power in that way. Something related to that is like mesh internet in New York city. There was a, a rooftop mesh project called NYC mesh. That's very successful. It's most people, especially in like um, low income NYCHA, the New York city housing authority buildings, their main internet is through this volunteer network and people just beam network point to point. And so that's, so the, the microgrid suggestion reminds me of like other ways of sharing um, community resources like that. And I think it's a great idea. Definitely. 
And if there aren't any other questions, are there any other questions? Feel free to hop on, everyone. When did you start this project? The I moved to Detroit in 2020, and then this particular house I've been working on since 2021. Um, so I guess it's coming up on, on two years now. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> thanks, uh, Learner, mm -hmm. for, for sharing what you've been doing, and thank you for doing what you've been doing. It's just a you know proof that one or very few can make a, a pretty large impact in the world and we often get you know kind of beaten down in our own thoughts that you know what what can i do to change the world little old me <laughs> and you know here we are you know single or couple individuals go into a neighborhood and start to revitalize it in all sorts of ways you know, we all have um, a lot more power than we assume, and especially when we start to combine the, that focus power with, with each other, we start to really multiply. Uh, thanks again. My pleasure. And I've also gained a lot of uh, emotional strength and support from people who are on Metagame, um, definitely from Musashi and other people who even showed interest in the project. So thank you for the chance to present today. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. P very passionate about what you're doing. Um, and feel free to drop any of your links in the voice chat for people to follow you, follow your projects, uh, Discord links, your website, Twitter, whatever you got. Feel free to drop it in there because we, like we like to be able to get involved where, where people are inviting it. And I, I know you mentioned... Uh, you're, you're definitely inviting people to come in and help out. So anyone, we already have a few metagamers in there, but hop in there, have some fun, learn some coding skills, learn some arcology knowledge, uh, and apply it to your own life and your own locale. Uh, traveling through time, you are next. Uh, do you want to hop on the mic and tell us a, a little bit about yourself first and then um, uh, tell us about all the work that you've been doing in arcology as well. You guys are beasts. <laughs> okay, um, I got involved in Bitcoin in 2011, and uh, <clears throat> I was kind of a libertarian ANCAP. I don't even know if I knew what ANCAP was back then. But uh, yeah, I kind of wasted my time for a few years, unfortunately. I think a lot of us might, <laughs> might uh, relate with that. But then... Uh, in 2017, my um, my friend he owns a restaurant in an older part of town. The buildings are like probably the late 1800s. They're built in the late 1800s, and he was complaining that his rent went up. And I was like, "Gosh, there's got to be like some kind of solution to this problem of these landlords sitting on properties for like hundreds of years." And uh, I thought, well, if only we could build new buildings on top of these old existing buildings and increase the supply of real estate. But then I thought we would have to design the buildings to be stackable. And then I thought, well, if, if you have stackable buildings, why don't you just connect those stackable buildings horizontally too? And that's really where uh, the idea first kind of hatched itself. And... Um, my my options were using squares or using hexagons. So I went with hexagons because they're more exciting, they're more interesting, and they're more futuristic. And so um, I decided to go down a path of um, these tessellated hexagons as uh, cellular skyscrapers. And I was already experimenting with, like, architecture at the time. And so... Um, this, this plan just really stuck in my mind and I, I just kind of loved the, the density of it and the fact that you can get rid of automobiles because, uh, all of the roads are indoors and all of the roads are three-dimensional. So, um, I don't, I'm not as prepared as learner. So let me, uh, pull up, pull up the video here and I could share my screen too. Um, but um, yeah, so I've been working on that since 2017, 
and it's kind of consumed my life. <laughs> so uh, if you look at my screen, this is one of my main videos. And this is, I call it version seven. I've made like seven cities so far. And it's a little fantastical. It's a little out there, but uh, I have found an engineering firm that makes steel warehouses. They specialize in steel warehouses. And um, they said that there's no problem with the scale and there's no problem with the design, that both of those things are fine because this is really just a hexagonal warehouse that's stacked on top of itself over and over and over again. So even though like it has a um, very new feel to the city and it, it like it looks radical, it's actually quite simple. And this is like uh, very similar to your normal commercial construction. Like, uh, like if you go to a Walmart or uh, some big box store. So, um, yeah, thanks to you guys, I built this in, uh, in Neos, uh, the interior in Neos. And um, it glitches out for some reason. I think I have too many MP4s on the walls. But um, when it's not glitching, it's, it's pretty cool. You can see all the apartments and stuff. Let me uh let me share my screen here. And why is it not okay? So if you check my screen, uh we have my main YouTube playlists. This is really Kate, this and Discord. Those are my two main platforms. And uh, I should really start using um, Twitter, but I don't really have a following on Twitter. So this is what I call the main playlist. But you're on Lens as well, aren't you? I'm pretty sure you're on Lens oh, as well. I man. am on Lens, yeah. I got like five or six videos on Lens too. <laughs> you can check me out on Lens. So um, these are kind of in order. You, you can kind of go down the rabbit hole and um, you, you, you kind of get like artistic breaks in here. There's some interiors, there's some artwork, there's some knowledge and mathematics and spreadsheets. So it's kind of an interesting mixture. I, I kind of like to put my better videos on the top of this one. Then here's the interiors. This is the hex residences. They're all numbered. I'm up to 48 right now. So I have 48 uh, interior blueprints. And a lot of them are like really, um, it might be an issue, but a lot of them have like shared kitchens and shared bathrooms and shared uh, shared spaces. So um, I, I love the idea, ideally. I have this like idealistic view of... Um, sharing a space with people and in reality i don't know it might be a little different <laughs> we'll see uh that that's a very um big question mark so you can just kind of go through this playlist and pick your favorite and um it has the roundabouts here this is number 19 uh, all of the roads are meet at six way roundabouts so there's no inner um there's no traffic signals and some of them have a little bit more effort put into ornamentation uh, but a lot of them are just kind of like that that's up to you the ornamentation is up to you so this is a new playlist called the simulation theory. And I basically manifest a group of people like a family and I calculate their UBI. I calculate their budget. I calculate their income in this city. And then I even make um, a schedule, a calendar. And you can kind of see how they live, how different people can live and how different people can survive and thrive on um, a short work week. So one of the main goals of this construction is to lower the cost of living and get the work week down to 
three days a week or even two days a week. If you have a larger family, it's probably going to need three days a week. But if it's just like you and your spouse, you can and one child, you can survive on two days a week, probably, D depending on like how nice your apartment is too and stuff like that. So uh, these are pretty interesting videos. They're pretty short too. So that's one of the main goals is to get um, like a two day work week. And um, we do that with contracts, contract law. That started in 2019. I started writing contracts because of my ANCAP background. And I thought to myself, no one else has done it. So why, have, why don't I do it? Like I have Microsoft Word, I can write a contract. So I started writing contracts in 2019 and it just um, keeps evolving and keeps evolving past what I even thought was an ideal like it's gotten really good so um it might upset some people in here but I did decide to ban landlords last year <laughs> so there's the landlord contract is illegal you can still finance uh construction with bonds so you can own bonds and get interest payments on the bonds but um it says in the city state constitution that uh, if you try and extract rent from someone, you can actually get fined for like, it was like, you get a fine for like five months rent of what you tried to extract or something like that. I forget exactly what it says, but it's something like that. So, um, and the potential tenant would report you <laughs> for, for trying to rent a property. So, uh, so yeah, that might upset a, little, a few people, but um I think housing speculation is, is a very uh, toxic part of society. And um, I think that society would be healthier without it. So why not rip off that Band-Aid? And um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of bonds. I'm a big fan of, of like corporate bonds or construction bonds. They, they're really what built America. America was built on bonds. And um, it's like tried and true. If it, ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's kind of my view for that. So um, I have thought about like an initial coin offering, which is like the opposite of a bond, <laughs> the polar opposite, uh, because people seem to love it, right? It seems to get a lot of interest. But um, I was working on making a ERC-20 coin for this project. I, th I think I might have done it actually. Uh, I have to look back into that. But um yeah, so we could talk about the contracts now. Here so here's the contracts. There's a city state contract that has a UBI direct democracy uh, I can't get into like a lot of the details, but there is an executive um, that determines changes to the contract and then a direct democracy votes and the direct democracy needs a five sixths to approve of the executive changes. There's for libertarian stuff, it uses gold, silver, Bitcoin. So 0% inflation. It has a balanced budget. It has no public school. Um, there's a citizen's arrest. So people, government employees that violate the contract can actually be arrested at any time, which I think people, might, a lot of libertarians would love that one. That one's really exciting. It makes me nervous just because I'm like, I'm like part of the, the system. So I gave everyone the ability to arrest me basically which is a little uh, a little scary to think about. Um, but this would be for a town or a city. There's one, um, not on this list, there's one for communes, which is more of like 5, 10, 20 people. And then there's one for corporations as well. This, this one at the top is for corporations. And they're all pretty much trying to increase uh, justice and righteousness. And um, that's pretty much the goal. 
The universal basic income is a $360 average. It scales with age, turns into social security. And uh, it has interesting and unique um, funding sources. So there's a very low property tax. The property tax for most people is like $50 a month. It's a very low property tax. If you have a smaller, it's based on your apartment size. If your apartment is small, you can actually pay $0 a month property tax. And that's a huge deal. People don't understand how, how badly property taxes drain the economy. So the total tax burden of the city-state contract is 80% lower than the United States. So the United States taxes like over $2,000 uh, per person per month. And this one is like 400 ish something like that so it's 80 percent lower 80 percent less tax burden and 90 percent of the taxes of the state go towards the ubi system so the administration is like probably 10 percent of the budget and then the other 90 percent goes to the ubi and the ubi is the entire welfare system of of the society so it's like we had a quick question it, before we move from that subject real quick. It, is rent free? Rent is not free. Well, there's no rent because there's no landlords. There and is no There's no landlords. And mortgages are not free. You would be uh, paying for construction and all of that. So based on the mass production of these hexagons, we are hoping to get um the cost of construction down to like forty dollars per square foot maybe 60. most residential construction today is like a hundred dollars per square foot so we're hoping to get like ideally maybe a 50 percent um of typical construction costs today so one of the reasons for that is we use uh a post and beam foundation so the found the foundation is quite small for these hexagons. It's just under the vertical columns and there's seven per hexagon, one in the middle and then six points. And then the siding is corrugated steel, which is really, really cheap. And uh, the roofs and ceilings are, um, they're steel too. So you don't need siding, you don't need a traditional roof and you don't need much of a, foundation and driveways are also quite expensive people don't think about that either so there's no driveway and you're also your land costs are extremely extremely low in in this construction technique i actually calculated uh, a while ago if um if you bought very cheap undeveloped land in i think i did like maine or something it was like 200 acres in maine and then you divide by how many people you could put on those 200 acres. It worked out to be like $4 per person was your land costs. <laughs> because uh, this is actually four times denser than Manhattan, depending on how high you go up vertically. So, uh, but even though it, it is four times denser than Manhattan, it has like five or six vertical layers. So the traffic is less than Manhattan. And then you factor in the two-day work week, and there's much less commuting for the two-day work week. So your traffic is actually like a third of what Manhattan is, even though it has four times the density. So you can you can estimate a lot of this stuff with algebra. Um, we had another question in the chat. Um, are you utilizing installation uh, or insulation in these uh, building processes? So the exterior hexagons, the ones that are touching the outside, you can add in insulation. But the ones that are touching each other, touching other hexagons, you don't actually need insulation for them. They actually have like incredibly high thermal insulation uh, because it's all about exterior surface area. And you can calculate the exterior surface area and, or well, estimate it. It's hard to get the exact number, but you can estimate it. and. <clears throat> the uh the the thermal efficiencies of this are actually so high 
that the human beings inside of the city, as well as all of the lighting and all of the electronics and things like showers and uh, clothes dryers and stuff, basically anything that generates heat will be enough to heat the entire city. And you actually need an active cooling system to cool off uh, the structure. And that's actually really con the cooling system. I actually put a bunch of time into and mathematics. The mathematics are very, very complicated, but uh, I have a few videos on the cooling system. And it's pretty remarkable. I'll have to check those out. I'm, I'm big into cooling systems, especially passive and evaporative. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll have to check those out. We use, uh, I decided to use off the shelf commercial AC units and like have hexagons full of them so these hexagons are like <laughs> these they cool uh they cool water to um like 40 degrees and then that 40 degree water is pumped through the city so i originally had um air cooling for the city and the vents were just too large and bulky and and i'd assume they would be really really loud too so by water cooling, you can make the uh, pipes much, much smaller and much quieter because the well, water can hold like a thousand times more thermal energy than air per volume. Uh, some, some crazy number like that. I have all the spreadsheets done. So, um, yeah, water cooling is a more expensive option. It's a more complicated option, but it's objectively better than air cooling. So we don't have to worry about that until it gets larger. Uh, um, another thing that I didn't really point out in the beginning is that this city is made out of 8,000 pieces, and you only have to start with one. You can actually start with a rhombus, which is a third of a hexagon, and then build out the whole city. So a rhombus is like six bedrooms. I have one of the blueprints for uh, an initial rhombus. and it'll be maybe 200,000 for, for the first rhombus and uh, could be less, could be more. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it would be more than 200,000, but that's a rough estimate. So in order to like seed the city, seed the city, it would be like $200,000. And then you're living in, in those six bedrooms. So, and then you build, you, you use your land to build and expand and build and expand and build and expand. So like once you get 20 or 30 people, you can consider having like a restaurant or something, a small restaurant. You can get like a school at like a hundred people and then you can keep um, deciding what you need as a community as it grows. And since you're in a rural area and you have like solar panels for electricity and um, your, your mortgage is basically being paid to your mortgage would, would be like the only concern really. Um, and food, maybe you can get food pretty cheap based on what you buy. <clears throat> like you don't have to eat steak every day. So um, the cash flow of, of the seed of the city is a concern. But if you can solve the cash flow problem of these little communal seeds, I like to call them, then uh, expansion should be um, easy and people will really want to, uh, to move to a place that's like cheap and growing and happy and uh it's, it won't be a life of luxury in the beginning but um as long as you as long as you're comfortable then uh then it should be pretty fun <laughs> yeah i've been meaning to tell you about uh have you ever seen a the cool bot I don't, I don't think I have. Okay. Uh, a few years back, I guess it's been many years back now, I was on a farm where we needed a, 
uh, walk-in freezer and cooler. And we had this big uh, refrigerated truck that we were going to convert into it. And we found this um, control unit called a cool bot. So it can hijack a standard like AC unit or wall mounted unit uh, or a window unit. And it just hijacks the sensor and makes it think that it's warmer out than it actually is. And so we put that in one half of the trailer and it made that half a walk-in freezer. We had a little sliding door to let the cool air leak into the next section, which made that a walk-in uh, refrigerator and then let that leak into some residents as an AC unit. Wow, that's clever. I love it. Yeah, solutions like that are uh, are very important for the communal um, time period. So the when I say communal, I don't mean like full communism. I mean like... Uh, the vision that I have for a communal space would be um, people who carry responsibilities for the community. They get paid. They they earn money. And it could be something mild, like, you know, $100 a month or something like that. But, you know, that adds up. That's significant. And uh, it includes, um, like, someone who's in charge of, like, decorations someone who's in charge of event planning, someone who cooks meals, which is a big one. The cooking meals would probably be the most labor and um, pull the most, uh, the most um, financing, whatever, not financing, but pay. And uh, there's a few more. Um, <clears throat> but that contract is pretty cool for, um, for just organizing a group of people to where no one feels taken advantage of, and w which is really important for uh, for a group of that size. But um, one, once we get to, I would say, like 100, 200, 300 people, um, I think we we start to leave that um, that danger zone <laughs> where the whole thing could fall apart from finance, from money, cash flow could destroy us, drama could destroy us, um, and stuff like that. But once you hit you know like a hundred plus people, I think I think you start to leave, uh, you start to get away from that danger zone. So any any questions and comments? I probably missed a bunch of stuff, but uh, it's been a it's been a pretty great uh, side by side chat going along with your conversation. Um, I haven't seen any questions that I haven't already asked or you haven't already answered. Except we might be getting another one now. Oh, uh, Smart Digital Payments is asking, so wait, um, 100 is the max capacity kind of thing, or 300, or more people is better? So if you look at the video, the video has um, like 120,000 people in the city. So it is, uh, it, I, ideally, the, it, you could stop growing, but ideally the vision would be to turn it into like an urban area or a small sized city because then you get a huge amount of benefits like um, all kinds of restaurants, all kinds of different um, interiors because everyone's in control of their own interiors. So there's um, an amusement park. If you see in my, in the discord stream and uh, there's a, a crane that a blimp crane that is tethered over the city and you can actually go up into the blimp and then like skydive from the blimp and stuff like that. So a lot of these um, really grandiose ideas, they don't make economic sense with a hundred people. You could never afford them. <laughs> but if you have 150,000 people, then all of a sudden they become very affordable. Like um, for example, a, um, 
a roller coaster I saw on Alibaba for $300,000. So <laughs> if you have if you have 150,000 people buying that roller coaster, it costs everyone $2. Sweet. So in the in the one city I made there's four roller coasters, four times two, it costs you $8. So uh, we had someone ask a question here, and I already know the answer, but I thought um, I'll try not to go too much over time because we're already eight minutes over. But uh, someone basically said, when Dow? Um, and I, I mentioned, hey, they technically are one already, just not titled that way. So could you explain? A, I know it's a little bit more complex to just shortly explain, but could you explain some of the governance? So there's an annual election for what I call the hexarchy, which is a rule by six. There's six people. And the top six people win the election. So by doing this, you um, avoid political parties. So like if everyone, let's say everyone wants a third party to win, right? Well, in this case, you have, your first party, second party, third party, fourth party, fifth party, sixth party, technically all could win at the same time. And then they all have a say, they all have influence in that um, executive. And then they determine changes to the system and to the tax rates. And a direct democracy has to approve of whatever they submit. So they also do um, hiring and firing. So they're like the HR of the government. And that's basically the, uh, the structure of, um, of the city government. And uh, they take in taxes and then they send out crypto payments to people. Uh, I, have the, I have the welfare system all done on Excel spreadsheet because I'm a terrible programmer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on Excel spreadsheet, it's actually working, uh, working great. So you would just submit your public key, your public address, and um, then our software would automatically calculate your UBI based on some input information. And then your UBI, let's say it would be like $250 a month. It would automatically create uh do the exchange rate for the $250, create a transaction, and then send the transaction to your public address. And it would go through the entire city once a month and do that for everyone in the city. So um, I have a video and I have a spreadsheet that shows all of the estimates for the entire budget. And um, you can go over the estimates yourself and consider how optimistic they are, how realistic they are. And uh, I really think the, uh, that we can have a balanced budget with like a $360 UBI. Maybe not in the commune stage, but like once we get to a few hundred people, it'll start to, um, it'll start to balance itself out. And uh, especially if we get um, a few uh, a, a few businesses, that because businesses um, they pay a little bit more in taxes for various reasons, so um, they kind of ground the budget. Does that answer your question? Um, I would assume so. <laughs> They're not asking more yet. Does anybody have any more questions before we wrap up? Where would we build? That's a good question. Hey. So we have uh, someone who is interested in Alabama, someone in Illinois, and I just got a message the other day of someone in Arkansas who is also interested with land. So, and this is also another uh, group here. Bobcat is part of the 
the group here he's well he's been vocal about uh his land in alabama and that is that is the land that would potentially be a part of this a land <laughs> yeah he also has sewer experience right Yes, he was a civil engineer, and waterworks was his main thing. Yeah, that's very important. <laughs> also, uh, both Learner and uh, Traveling Through Time, I don't know if you guys caught it, but earlier in the chat, Philens um, has some, some microgrid experience that he may be able to offer up to you all. I would definitely hit him up on that. That sounds amazing. Thank you. I'll, I'll look into it. And you can say felons. It's all right. Yeah, we were actually thinking a great way to generate cash flow initially is to sell solar power to the grid. And we can get like $1,000 a month just from that. And that's like almost free money. <laughs> Yeah, net metering's changed a bit, so uh, it depends on the state, it depends on the utility. Yeah, yeah, we looked it up. This is for Alabama. All right, on cool. Anyway, I am here for you. Yeah. So um, another thing, um, the uh, if you look at your savings, you save money for your property taxes. You save money for not needing a car. You save money for not using gasoline. And then you save money on heating and cooling. And if you add up all these savings, it works out to be almost like $15,000 per year. And then the construction is cheaper because of the mass, the mass production of the, the buildings. So your, um, your mortgage might only be like you know $60,000, $80,000, something like that. And you're saving $15,000 a year from these various sources so that fifteen thousand dollars you take divide by 60 whatever is four years 60 divided by 15 so in four years your savings pays off your mortgage or or pays for your mortgage you still need to earn that sixty thousand dollars but um if your wages if your wages remain the same then it would only be four years worth of uh, worth of savings to pay off your mortgage. Could we connect Detroit Solar Microgrid with Illinois, Arkansas, Alabama land? Would love for Arcology and Detroit Arcology to be able to co-generate power for each other. That's learner. I think you lose too much power from those distances. I think so too. That's a lot of copper, too. <laughs> it's a lot of copper and um, substations. But well, solar is amazing. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean we couldn't, you know, move further on Nikola Tesla's work. And I, I've done a lot of experimentation with that and have, you know, charged batteries and phones from over 7,500 feet away no connections, wireless uh, energy transmission. So, um, you know, no, no reason why we can't eventually have a network that can be generating and sharing energy freely uh, without, without all the copper. Yeah, the case for solar just keeps getting better and better. I bought my panels um, in 2013 and I paid, I think it was 80 cents per kilowatt hour, or not kilowatt, but 80 cents per watt. And uh, that was not including shipping. Shipping was more. Now they're, they're 20 cents a watt, so they're four times cheaper, and the efficiency is doubled. <laughs> so, so four yeah. times cheaper, double efficiency in 10 years. Yeah, and depending on how, how fancy you need to be, you know, like, um, th these cities would obviously be high quality, high tech, super awesome, but I've made my own really makeshift solar panels from old TV glass and old, 
uh, tube TVs taking out their their Tesla coils to step up voltage. You know, it, it cost me zero dollars. I made my own batteries. I even tested out using my own piss as electrolytes. You know, like uh, you don't have to even really because our our world is full of all this stuff that's free. <laughs> you can technically build all of this yourself. It may not be top notch. It may not be putting out a hundred percent quality, but when it's costing you nothing, um, yeah, well worth it. Are you familiar with Cobb? Oh yeah, yeah. If we're worried about um, capital or cash flow in the beginning, that might be a good option too. Yeah, I actually prefer Waddle and Dob, which is a you know, it's it's Cobb but with stick a stick grid in between to add some rigidity but oh, yeah okay, yeah love it yeah and then uh if uh if and when our hexagons grow we can just knock it down sadly <laughs> and it returns to the earth But uh, I'm very optimistic with um, the future, and there's just so much potential. We just need to uh, to get started, really. And um, I think it would be so much fun to to build community outside of the internet. And. Uh, We lost traveling through time. Um, on the move. I was wondering if that was me. <laughs> oh no! I think that's the longest I've ever seen him screen share and do virtual camera. So, it's a new <laughs> hey, welcome back, my broski. <laughs> welcome back to now. What were you saying, yeah. traveling, my bro? It's just been really cool to uh, build community in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's quite a few of us here that are all about it. Musashi, is there a land to visit right now? Like, is Metafest, I think, is going on right now? Uh, Metafest is not going on yet. That's in August. Were you specifically asking about like the uh, solar panels that I've made and batteries and stuff like that? Oh yeah, in the chat you said that there are newer things to see if we visit the lands. Do you mean your lands or are there metagame lands or other <clears throat> lands somewhere? Um, so these are just lands that other people or communities own that I've gone to and and done some some. Uh, different types of uh sustainable tech so like one is a private land up in vermont i can probably get you in contact with with the guy who owns it but he was a um a nuclear engineer on the uss enterprise um <laughs> the the real one and so he and, it, and his name is scott he was an en he was the head engineer <laughs> oh my god love it Fucking hilarious. Scott Russell is his name. He has a YouTube channel called um, Made by One Man. I met him after I was done with a lot of like Tesla experiments and then got really into Edward Leed Skullnin. I ran into this guy because he was basically trying to prove how Edward Leed Skullnin used the same techniques that um, Nikola Tesla and the, at least the Great Pyramid uh builders used and he proved it that's he built the coral castle in, in south florida and so I, I went to this guy's land because we really started connecting in a few radio shows over ham radio and then um i saw that he was he was actually doing the thing so i went out there and 
he builds all his own Tesla towers, to, uh, you know, Wardenclyffe towers, he builds his own Tesla coils, uh, builds his own um, radio towers and antennas, builds his own windmills, water mills, solar panels, um, builds his own vehicles, uh, electric ram vehicles. So we had like high geared video or uh, high geared vehicles that slowly crept through the woods but could carry a massive amount of wood over hard terrain and, and hills uh called it a cricket <laughs> and then he had you know like higher speed vehicles that were not able to move a lot but moved fast like all sorts of cool stuff um that that would be one place you could find some things that i've built um we act, I actually had set up an Airbnb there where we had a little radio shack uh, set up next to a stream with uh, a water mill that powered, you know, a few batteries in there. And so it was a, it was a minimalist retreat place for artists or writers to get away. And they had a little radio there and they could plug in and power their laptop or their phone, but pretty much nothing else. Just had a, a bed, a desk and a wood a very small wood burning stove right there and all their power came from the river just a few feet away it was really really a beautiful site i don't think that he has it listed anymore but he'd probably let you come through and stay if you kind of help chop some wood or something <laughs> i'm really good at chopping wood i mean i'm so so but i would do it really enthusiastically luckily you don't have to carry water um all the uh the we have one windmill that that's all it does is just pumps water all day long you just you know turn a knob or just put a bucket out or <laughs> whatever it's always pumping water and it just drops back into the well if you're not using it i'd love to visit it sounds wonderful But yeah, if we don't have any other questions, I think we've gone well over time and it was well worth it because uh, we were traveling through time today. Um, appreciate Learner and traveling time, not only for what you're doing, but coming here and, and showing us and giving us some uh, some ways that we can connect with you and be able to build the same time, the same ways and, and learn from each other. I know traveling times having connection issues. I'm good now. Cool. Well, I think that pretty much concludes the the community call. And thanks again for coming out, everyone. Um, we'll be getting this uploaded. Our our famous tech shaman bogey has been recording. It'll be out on YouTube and LensTube and all the good stuff. Excellent. Thanks. All right, Thanks, everyone. Coach. Thank you. Everyone take care and go out there and change the world. Look at look at just a couple of people are doing. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a great day. Take it easy. Have a great weekend. Stay blessed and stay frosty. We the Metafam. Woo. Yeah. Cameraman, get your ass out of there, bro.